church that is uh, many parishes across the state. Yeah, and where it's, it's in the place northwest, south of the nation, which is the middle of the north. Yeah. But the five buildings we designed that are also in the earthquake, which is designed according to the map yeah. that engineers without the waters unscathed. It's, well. just, it's just, it's amazing. Yeah. I know it's, it's so simple. Well, the story is from, we did a, I'll show a few slides from a big thing we did for Haiti in 2020. Um, the two and I tried to get our faculty to just invent a one-page code for the homeowner. Right. See, and that's, this is an institution. And they wouldn't do it. I think my greatest achievement, I don't want to say, I actually got to see the Are you telling me to do something there instead of on the computer? Okay, all right. Um, so uh, you might notice that I added UM to the title if you had looked at a flyer before this because I teach at the University of Miami and I realized that um, it would be incorrect to be taking a couple days leave from the university without saying a few things about it. And um, you'll also see that much of the work is tied together between our work in the university and um, in the office, which is, I know, something you all do. Um, you work with communities. Um, Michael, thank you for 
the introduction. Um, I had a very nice welcome by Scott Truex and Nihal Pereira. Um, Scott and um, Michelle Munier um, and I worked on a project together many, many years ago. I won't tell you when. Um, but it's really wonderful to come back um, to be among you again. Um, and I've always had a great respect um, and admiration for this university because you have worked with communities um, uh, probably by charter since forever. Um, and so in a sense you were leading the pack and I learned a lot from you um, when we did the State Road 332 charrette many years ago. Um, in particular, I learned um, how great it is to have something called an urban assault vehicle. <laughs> that stayed with me because back then um, your faculty had convinced the state legislature to pay for a very large RV which was full of equipment, um, which of course was different then than it would be now. Um, it had things like a blueprint machine and flat files, um, all the things you always want to have with you on charrette or used to want to have with you on charrette, and it had a Barca lounger. Um, and we've always dreamt of having such a vehicle on the many charrettes that I've done um, with DPZ and UM. So um, I don't think you have one now, do you? That was then, this is now, right? Anyway, um, and of course I know others on your faculty, including um, Professor Bellello. So um, what I'm going to do is show you um, a generation of work. Um, I'm already old enough to call myself a generation. Um, I might point out uh, to this mixed gender audience that when I was here that long ago, uh, I think the most of the team, if not all of it, was men. Um, I didn't think it was odd that I might have been the only woman or one of very few because that's the way it was back there, back then. Um, and that certainly has changed. Um, we are not seen in the leading ranks of our professions um, as much as in medicine or law. Uh, and it's gonna be up to your generation to change that because um, mine didn't do a very good job of it. Uh, what this slide represents is um, many years of work that I think looking back over it was a special moment, um, a special time in which there was um, very little conflict in our part of the world. Um, there was, um, there were many resources um, and it was a time of intellectual discovery, of trying to recover knowledge, which essentially um, people who built places, human settlements, towns in Western culture um, and in other parts of the world knew very well how to do until World War II, or maybe until the Depression. And then we lost our minds and we forgot all of the good things we knew and thought we had to start from scratch. Um, and invent a whole new way of doing things. Um, that's true of almost any field you're in, um, even if you're a farmer. So I think all of my generation, um, all of us in all of our different fields have spent time trying to recover the valuable knowledge of our predecessors. And um, uh, much of what I'm going to be telling you is how that knowledge now exists or how, how we recovered it the victories along the way. Um, and if you're smart, you will be thinking about, um, that's not a very nice thing to say. I might suggest that you be thinking about how you can use that knowledge to advance your own generation. Um, that instead of going, saying we have to start over um, because everything has to be new, inventive, original, innovative, and you know, after all, we have all this new technology out there, so shouldn't we throw that old stuff out? Um, try to figure out which, what of that knowledge that we, our generation has brought forward to you can continue to be useful. Um, uh, and you will advance that much further. Um, and I say this also because I think what you, you don't always know why your faculty or the people uh, immediately ahead of you, your employers or um, the people you're working with, 
why they think are thinking certain ways and why um, they're telling you what they're telling you or why they admire what they do or why they think you should do things a certain way. And that's because the history's not, the immediate history is not written down. What our experiences have been uh, are not yet in the history books. So anyway, they get rewritten in odd ways when the historians get to them. So uh, this is a kind of um, special opportunity to let you know what's been happening in the prior generations. Why does the new urbanism exist? Who, who are the people who started it? Why were they um, doing that? And um, hopefully it might help you in your work. Um, so I won't spend so much time on every slide after this. Uh, so all of that trajectory um, has been carried out by a large group of people. And uh, some of them started organizations um, somewhat uh, directed according to their disciplines. The, um, the smart growthers the, is the large policy, generally the large policy picture, new urbanism concerned with um, how community design fits into those bigger policy pictures, the Institute for Classical Architecture and Art, focusing us on excellence in traditional architecture and so on. And there's really one missing, which is the National Association of Town Builders, uh, which are the developers who were the town founders of the new places that gave so much impetus to these ideas um, in real conditions. Um, and the other um, good news for you is that there has been a lot of um, a lot written down. So these aren't really the history books of the last 30 years, but um, these are books that record the kind of discovery, recovery of techniques. And um, you know, if you can't go around and visit all of the, these places you'd like to see, uh, maybe you will find them in the literature. So hopefully. Um, and I was worried about this during the recession, that uh, it would be like 1929 again. Um, the loss of economic impetus would mean the ideas would be lost too, or the knowledge would be lost. Um, hopefully these books will help it last um, beyond uh, what's happening now or later. So um, how did it all start? Um, certainly there was a group of people in the late 70s that were thinking about environment, society, and economy being more environmentally responsible. And some of us were living in um, the Sun Belt in suburban places, and we began to understand the problems of post-war growth in the US. That little diagram is um, point A and point B share a backyard fence, and the only way they can visit each other is um, through that seven mile uh, drive. And that lack of connectivity um, we were beginning to grapple with, with this early 80s, 1980s diagram that was trying to explain the difference between the suburban separation of uses um, and vehicle dependence um, in contrast to traditional towns that were highly connected and mixed use. Um, we didn't know at the time that, in fact, that had existed in drawings and theory uh, in 1930, the Clarence Perry diagram of the neighborhood unit. Um, so we took that and redrew it um, for our own purposes uh, some years later once we had learned about it and um, tried to project through drawings um, some of the theory. Uh, we also didn't know that there was a connection between trouble in the cities and suburban growth. Um, but eventually we learned that these were connected um, conditions. Uh, this is a, a drawing that was done when I worked with the University of Michigan with Doug Keldahl uh, uh, one winter with his students of Detroit, a uh, piece of Detroit in 1950 and um, Detroit after they put the highways, overlaid the highways. And uh, of course, those highways were about bringing people in from the suburbs into the city um, and eventually overwhelming it. So uh, this is the congenial group that started the Congress for the New Urbanism. Um, I uh, might invite you to consider joining the group uh, in their annual conference this year, which is close to you. It's in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, 
uh, in either May or June, I'm sorry I didn't bring the date, um, they have special arrangements for students um, and, and faculty, so um, this is a chance to do it, to see it, um, see us in action. Usually half of the group meeting, it's about a thousand people, are uh, people within some regional trajectory who don't go on an annual basis and then they're the old friends who go every year. Um, and some of them are in this photo. Um, but the thinking started with the kind of broad ideas that we now call smart growth. Um, when we signed, a few of us signed the Awani principles in California. And those of us who were there said, this is not good enough. Um, these are some big ideas, but it's not gonna get us where we need to go. And so we wrote the charter for the new urbanism, um, which lays out um, at regional scale, neighborhood scale, street and block scale, uh, what the goals should be. And it starts out by saying, we recognize that um, the, this isn't the exact wording, the urban decampment and suburban sprawl are an interrelated condition. Now, Andres and my engagement with this began with buildings. Uh, and I think one of the things that's important about the new urbanism is that every discipline um, plays a role in this kind of generalist approach um, with each discipline um, striving for excellence in its, in its specialty. So we, were, we started out as architects who wanted to be very good architects. This was, we didn't know that we'd be doing urban design at the time. Uh, and we were also very intrigued um, by the fact that most of the US was building houses. Um, perhaps they were mostly kitsch, but most housing had some traditional aspect to it. That wasn't true around the rest of the world, um, but it certainly was even in the suburbs. And uh, we were challenged by the idea that you could bring excellence through into traditional, with traditional architecture, um, trying to continue the history or evolve the history of traditional architecture uh, instead of just mimicking it or um, using it weakly in a kind of kitsch, um, with a kitsch result. So um, these are houses, um, South Florida, Texas, and they refer to uh, not only the history of their region and the building materials and methods, but also um, uh, they are an exploration of the longer history of our profession. Uh, and then there were houses that began to deal with um, climate and um, uh, weather concerns, these houses that are raised, uh, the house on the lower left, uh, each one of the bays um, has a garage door that comes down so the whole house can get enclosed when a um, hurricane is coming. Uh, and the church on, the, uh, on your right, um, uh, in the suburbs with very um, inexpensive construction was an attempt um, to study how space or some kind of civic presence can be made in a landscape that otherwise um, doesn't generate it. In 1980, at the very beginning of all that, um, we built one spec house for a developer and it didn't sell. The house on the right, we thought we were doing a kind of nice modern Adolf Loos take on um, the individual house in South Florida, but it was culturally at that time. Now there are a lot of white box houses, um, but it was, it was too difficult um, for the housing market to take on. So, the next project was a housing subdivision. The one on the right is in Boca Raton. And we um, thought about what urban housing um, is most like or uh, most akin to our climate. And we looked to Charleston, South Carolina to build, to design these Charleston side yard houses. Um, my photograph doesn't show the side yard porches, but they do have that. And this was wildly popular. It just sold out immediately. and. Um, uh, so this was a kind of very interesting cultural lesson about housing, um, in particular because the prior buildings I showed you were housing for clients or the church um, was a patron. Um, but when you do housing um, with developers, 
or the government. Um, you don't have a client or a patron. Um, you have customers, you have buyers, and in the US, they usually have a choice. Um, and so we have continued, there are two more recent projects. I'm just making the point that our uh, engagement with architecture continues. Um, these two are infill projects in Coral Gables, which has, uh, which was a new town from the 20s and has um, some very stylistically specific pockets that they call villages. Um, and so we were contributing to those um, by making a couple of new ones. And one reason to do that is not only that they have a, a sense of place or a special character, um, but they're actually valued more. They have, uh, they're a really good example of design um, having a value in which a village house in Coral Gables will be higher priced than a normal house across the street. Um, so I think that was probably a very important lesson for us as we uh, got into community designs and multiple places with multiple buildings. So probably this is um, a familiar photograph. Um, following Charleston Place, we were asked um, by Robert Davis to work with him on Seaside, and um, I could say the rest is history and just go home right now. Um, but I'm gonna continue and show you where Seaside led us. Um, this is how it looked um, uh, in 1995. It was really started in 83. Um, and um, it's actually surrounded now by watercolor, um, which was designed by the same architects who worked on Celebration. Um, had beautiful gardens by Warren Bird, the UVA uh, landscape architect. And um, out of Seaside grew before I go there, I'll just point out a few things. Um, at the time, we thought we were making a place where we, of modest um, dimensions, of modest ambition, but the main one was to make the public spaces, to make a public realm, even in this semi-rural um, density of um, coastal Florida. And so you can see the first plaza and the section drawings, which were um, the drawings that were guiding us. Um, those photographs um, show Seaside in its early days when the scrub oak was still low. The buildings have enabled it to grow uh, and there's a whole new ecology without introducing any new landscape um, that has emerged um, through, uh, in which building has had a beneficial effect on the natural environment. There are more birds, um, et cetera. There's a long story, we have a lecture on the green coast um, that gets into the details. Um, the, the drawing on the left is the zoning code. Um, actually, it was design guidelines. It wasn't even a zoning code. There were no rules to prevent us from doing seaside. That's the critical um, uh, magic of the place uh, because sometimes the laws can prevent you from doing good things. Um, and eventually, um, as people got to know this document better and what it was producing, we didn't design a single building in Seaside. All of, all of it is done by other architects. Uh, very often, uh, at the time, young people, even before they were licensed, um, and they were just following the urban regulations, um, where, where they needed a porch, how tall it could be, um, no cars out front, and so on. Um, and that became, uh, at some point, the, a more generic code, the traditional neighborhood development code, uh, which we initially wrote in the same manner, using the same matrix. It's now, um, it can be part of a book like any other. And um, this started being used by communities around the country to try to help guide uh, new neighborhood building and old neighborhood rebuilding. So along the coast, um, there are several other new towns, Rosemary Beach and Alice Beach that we worked on. Alice Beach, uh, each one of them has an evolution. I won't go into that. Uh, from Seaside, Alice Beach in particular is hardened for um, increasingly harsh uh, climate issues. And um, all of these towns are within, I think about 30 or 40 miles from the eye of um, the recent hurricane that just passed through Mexico Beach. Um, and on there was destruction on the other side of them, but they 
um, withstood very well because they're all very well built. Uh, and there was a great deal of attention to quality. Um, one of the evolutions, by the way, from the, from the house on its lot, the American, the Anglo-American prototype, is that Alice Beach has courtyard houses. Um, um, an Arabic, Mediterranean, South American type of residence, which would never, ha would have been like that White House in Coconut Grove uh, if we had tried something like this 20 or 30 years ago. But um, the culture has changed also. Um, so, but it was Seaside which got tremendous amounts of publicity um, and invited others um, by its example to see how it could work in other places. So Gaithersburg, Maryland, um, the kind of typical suburban um, growth of Washington, D.C., uh, produced Kentlands in the mid-80s. Um, this was done with a charrette that was widely publicized. And uh, I'm just showing you a few components of the advances Kentlands made. Um, the old farm neighborhood has the farmhouse and the barn and is um, aggregated in almost a medieval or, or historic town way, dealing with topography and old buildings. Um, the standard suburban house streets have moved to the garage to the back. Um, you probably think this is normal now, but it wasn't then. Um, uh, the school, oops, um, the, I have two things on my screen, which is, confuses me. Um, the mixing of price points of large houses and small houses, which was verboten, uh, and still is to some degree in suburban development, um, uh, these had, uh, the large house was twice the cost, or three times the cost of the small house. And that kind of um, mixing in close proximity speaks to social integration uh, in a way that still uh, is difficult in this country. Uh, the school, which was intended to, uh, was originally designed to face the highway. The developer paid for a front door to face the um, the, the village and um, both students and teachers walk to school, which um, I think you might know doesn't happen in much of the country anymore. Uh, the first live works um, were built in Kentlands. The idea that um, you might own a building which has different uses down below from above. Um, there are three kinds of retail in Kentlands and this is the, the most vibrant um, even though it's the least programmed. And uh, Kentlands had an influence on the city that it was the municipality within it, which, within it, within which it is. I'm going too quickly. Um, and Gaithersburg started to look at its historical downtown to see whether it wasn't worth um, preserving and reviving. Um, so there are many of these new communities around the country. Um, one that may be closer to you, uh, Newtown Lake. Charles uh, in Missouri. Um, if you go to Louisville, uh, I'm sure some of the events will take place in Norton Commons, um, which has been building for the last um, 15 or 20 years. Um, and uh, Montgomery County, Maryland, which is probably um, the best example of inclusive zoning of a of a government which has written a law that requires a certain amount of affordable housing within every new housing development, um, we were able to design one in which um, these are old prices that you see, but that kind of mix of uh, affordable, even housing, um, uh, housing agency owned low rent units next to fairly um, ambitious market rate units. Um, enabled, was a kind of support of that policy, um, which every generate, every 10 years somebody tries to take apart, but continues in, in Montgomery. So, you know, those are all new places. That's perhaps easy enough, although nothing was easy uh, in any of them. Uh, what about the difficult old places? Um, one day we received visitors in Miami telling us that they would like us to bring Seaside to Cleveland. Um, and we said, in, no, that's really not a great idea. Um, we told them all the reasons they shouldn't do it. And they said, 
if it's good enough for those people, it's good enough for us. And that convinced us to work with a non-for-profit in Cleveland. Um, and in this case, uh, what you could see was a, a kind of emptied out uh, neighborhood after the 68 riots. A few people still living in their houses because they couldn't possibly sell them to anyone. Um, a street network that we realized had been developed during um, uh, as a company town with uh, uh, very little connectivity. And so we redrew that network through the open, um, uh, the open land. Um, and you can see the new streets in the photograph. Um, this was, in fact, a template for Hope 6, um, the HUD program, uh, which started to bring mixed income housing into um, public housing uh, within a few years after this. Um, and part of our work was to develop two unit types which would enable those old ones to remain and be renewed. In other words, to revalue the existing old houses that were there rather than starting over and saying, uh, you got to do something different, they're no good. Uh, I don't know if, let me not go there, I'm going to criticize somebody that I shouldn't. Um, and uh, these are the kinds of drawings that were used in um, public process to talk to people about those historic types. Um, and this is the result already photographed a long time ago, so probably the trees are large by now. Uh, the old street trees on the, on the right were still there. Uh, and when you look at this photograph, I'm sure it's difficult to tell what's old and what's new. Uh, and of course, that was the intention. Um, I've already mentioned that Hope 6 grew out of that, and um, there are some beautiful Hope 6 neighborhoods in the country now. The CNU wrote the standards, the design guidelines for Hope 6, like at the last minute before it, the program became uh, a kind of completely funded and implementable um, federal project. And so some wonderful, really wonderful things have been built. Um, this project, which we worked on, um, took advantage of trees in the backyards of the public housing buildings that had been there and um, redrew the street diagram to put the streets or the public realm where the largest, um, where this grand amenity of beautiful old trees was. So we just completely flipped the plans um, in order to bring the new buildings to face um, a beautiful public realm. Um, West Palm Beach, um, which had 70 acres of cleared land, um, cleared because of um, management problems. This was the high, um, the high days of crack cocaine, and people were just clearing um, whole tracts of land in cities to try to resolve that problem. Um, produced a plan and design guidelines, form-based design guidelines, um, with a wonderful mayor, Nancy Graham, um, who promoted this project. And the drawing uh, shows you how it filled in over time, um, including um, a shopping center, but uh, it looks like a downtown, using an existing church, maintaining a historic church as a focus. So, you know, at some point people started saying, well, what about the suburbs? You're working on new pieces, you've worked on existing cities. Uh, what are we going to do about all that stuff we've built in the suburbs? Um, and um, probably the first suburban retrofit um, that anyone did has done is Mashpee Commons. Um, this was started by the owner, um, a, man, a young, then young man of our generation. Uh, who took the family shopping center, uh, one of the revenue generators for the family. You can see it on the left um, above. And um, started to turn the buildings around so they would face a street rather than a parking lot. Um, he came to DPZ and we helped him develop the plans for a larger plan, which you can see um, drawn and also um, building out in the aerial photograph. Um, here it is um, expanding even further. Um, and 
the scale of it uh, you see on the right. It even had someone willing to build a two, two movie screen cinema, which became a neighborhood focus. Um, this has lots of great stories um, that I'd love to tell, but I'm going to move on. Um, in a different place, under a different economic condition, uh, a very popular shopping center in south of Miami um, was uh, brought to us by a chamber of commerce that understood that the, the node of streets and transit that existed around this mall um, really required it to change over time, even if the mall owner was happy with the mall the way it was. Um, and so um, uh, with Dover Coal, another firm uh, in Miami, and the Chamber of Commerce and a lot of public participation, um, we generated a plan that uh, projected its future. Um, it was um, a very interesting kind of process in which uh, completely inexperienced people generated eight different plans, um, which uh, it turns out had about half a dozen common characteristics that then became the core of the plan, which the county government, by the way, didn't want. They didn't want any drawings in their zoning code. They said, just write it up, would you? And uh, we found that almost impossible to do. Uh, but some of the tools we used were uh, these kind of scale comparisons. I'm sure uh, if you haven't done them yet in your studios, you will be doing them. Um, this one is probably from Alan Jacobs' book um, of Great Streets, which also has uh, terrific figure grounds of existing cities. And we showed the public um, probably about a dozen different um, drawings, and they all pointed to Savannah. And they said, we want that because it has all those parks. Um, and so we're beginning to get some of those. Um, the county finally acquiesced to some very primitive diagrams, but the key issue here is the drawing on the right, which is the street, um, the design guidelines that tell the developers how they must face the street. And some of the streets have arcades, very specifically, those are the colored, that's the colored key um, in the middle drawing. Uh, they don't all have arcades. And what you might notice is that there's also a piece at the top. Um, the neighbors didn't want any more height than what's already there in one or two buildings, and we convinced them that maybe if they treated it as a penthouse, they would allow a little bit more height. Um, and so um, that's what you see rising today. Those dual buildings are actually two separate buildings. Um, um, the, the floor plate of a high rise uh, is very important because it can become something that blocks sunlight, views, creates shadows, uh, overwhelms the neighborhood, and these have a floor plate limit. Um, if you've ever been to Vancouver, um, where some wonderful small high rises have been built on bases of townhouses and, and central gardens, um, you'll find out that their high rise plate is 8,000 square feet. Uh, nobody else, no one in the US will agree to such a small plate, but at least you can keep it um, somewhere in the teens. Um, buildings. Um, so the engagement with buildings continues. Um, we designed the Live Works for the NAHB, the annual builders convention, where they always build a new idea. Um, these were built in Atlanta. Um, and this, so this concern of remaking um, places produced a book by one of my partners, Galina Takcheva, uh, which is a kind of manual for what to do with the suburbs. Um, from the largest scale um, at, uh, this is a series of pages from the uh, regional scale, how to identify the places of remaking. Uh, and then it goes through a series of case studies that even get down to um, how to rebuild a suburban house in a way that's more uh, friendlier to the public realm. Um, around the same time, we were asked to do an economic study, a planning study, which was really an economic study for the agricultural areas which still exist in our county. Um, so over on the left, you see Miami, and off the map is the fact that the Keys are just starting there. So there's 
the only subtropical growing place in the United States is left in our county. At that time, it was 80,000 acres. I think it's down to 50 or 60 now, but we're, we're hanging on to it. Um, and this study um, looked at it in terms of the economy, but also zoning issues and how you could um, buy down the value of the land, which is what you need to do when metropolitan growth starts overtaking ag land that you want to keep. Uh, and those uh, policy tools are um, uh, what you see on the screen, easements, um, purchasing development rights, transferring development rights. Um, that produced more ag work. Um, there are ag villages um, in uh, Great Britain and Scotland that um, are growing up. They're just beginning to, they just, they have the first buildings. Uh, and this booklet, which um, was produced as a result of that, uh, that gives some examples and instructions. Um, meanwhile, the new places we were building were starting to incorporate things like community gardens and letting people have um, uh, certain kinds of animals in their, um, in their houses or in their yards. Um, this is, I think this is, this might be Newtown, St. Charles. So that mix from downtown um, through the suburbs to the ag land and also some challenges uh, of the new urbanists by the environmental community, um, which would prefer that we never grew outside of cities ever again and just rebuilt what we have, which is absolutely correct, but somewhat unrealistic. Um, we began to think about what is that interface between the environment and the natural environment and the built environment. And I won't spend a lot of time describing the transect um, because you can find material on it. Um, CATS, the Center for Applied Transect Studies, transect.org um, uh, is where you can learn more about it. But this has guided a lot of work and a lot of policy uh, writing um, because it just makes so much sense um, that there is a kind of um, a series of transitions in density which can be identified by the character um, of the natural and built environment and that you can actually control that to the benefit of both um, the natural ecology and humans. Um, so what does that have to do with Miami Beach? Well, even here we could um, illustrate the kind of density transect um, of how you might go from high rises on one side of the beach to the single family houses, which are just off the photograph um, to, the, uh, to the bottom of the photograph and show a kind of transition of density, um, which begins to mollify the kind of NIMBY concerns that people have of um, you give them an inch and they'll take a foot. If you put another tall building that close to my house, my house is the next one to go. Um, and instead showing them a kind of rational uh, arrangement um, can be very helpful. Um, so this is what um, Aqua looks like. It has also served to calm down some of the concern that all of new urbanism has to be traditional um, because this um, is in the mode, it's in the tradition of Miami Beach of being a 20th century architecture. Eight different architects um, worked on this place. Um, it's not real new urbanism because after it was designed, um, the entry street was gated. Um, not our idea, but it still exists. Um, so the introduction mentioned that we've worked abroad. Um, we've worked on not all of the continents and we've had um, DPZ affiliates in several different places that have advanced these ideas, as well as, of course, many other um, people working um, in their own firms. So this is in um, Baja, California, and um, this was actually a Canadian developer who agreed, uh, as we all began to look at a very large tract of land together, um, that he was willing to give up, if he could get a certain density, 
uh, on the lower land, which of course would be easier to build on as well, but he would be happy to give up a permanent conservation easement on the mountains um, and on the, the hilly land that he owned. And so that's what you see um, in this <coughs> photograph. Um, it took on um, the traditional character of um, historical Mexican towns, um, but it has a very um, elaborate environmental uh, agenda as well. In Europe, um, there's um, a coastal town um, next to a, a, a garden city like Coral Gables called Knocke, um, Knocke Heist, um, you see here, which we worked on with Leon Creer. Um, I would say, I'm not showing it, but it, I should have. The, probably the place that best fulfills all the goals of smart growth and new urbanism um, is Poundbury, the Prince of Wales town. Now, that's sometimes a hard pill for people to swallow because there's so much controversy um, about the, especially with regard to the prince's attitude towards um, modern architecture. But in fact, it has, and from the start, um, it has workplace. It's put craftsmen back to work building. Um, it has affordable housing mixed in with, you know, government subsidized housing mixed in with market rate. It's absolutely beautiful, um, and it. Uh, does advance uh, traditional design with some of the best designers. Uh, and finally, um, uh, one of my partners, um, Marina Corey, um, has been developing work in the Middle East. Um, this is the sketch for a project in Jeddah. Um, she did the regional plan for Mecca. She can't go into Mecca herself, uh, but she told people how to do it. And um, she's also working in Kuwait. Um, and so that's an area where there's a tremendous amount of urban growth and there is an opportunity to make, help that growth develop in such a way that it um, might be less vehicle dependent um, and less um, energy dependent. Um, I've mentioned the transect. Um, the third code after the traditional neighborhood Development is um, actually a small book that carries um, the whole range of densities. And um, there is now, I think there are about 400 codes in the country that have been rewritten using the SMART code as the template. Um, we used it um, under the leadership of Manny Diaz when he was mayor to completely rewrite the city of Miami code. Um, this was quite an undertaking. It involved other planning um, related to transportation, um, landscape, parks, and so on. But the big deal was actually rewriting the code. Um, with these kinds of um, basic, this basic structure, um, understanding that the city was already made of, had a certain physical character. We, at the outset, we would tell the public that um, it's really, Miami's an adolescent. Um, it already has bones and its, its character has been established. Um, we're just sending it to finishing school. And, um, uh, and so using this existing structure of the building, we were trying to bring it um, to a point that it was away from just individual projects built one by one to one in which new building would start producing a public realm um, of some unity and um, benefit for pedestrians. Uh, and that would be done uh, through the structure of the transect. Uh, and so these were, uh, these are actually um, renderings that the city put together to get it started. But the idea was to move from this kind of condition, um, sun baked uh, sidewalks with parking lots next to them. Uh, to a, a public initiative to remake the streets, um, largely with landscape and streetscape. That's, after all, the public property. That's what the city can do. Um, and then um, asking through the regulatory structure of the code, the private sector to develop buildings that would have uh, frequent doors and windows, be um, interesting for pedestrians, so that the public realm would become safe, comfortable, and interesting. Um, the corridors, which were 
languishing because they're full of traffic, how to remake those um, so they might be more amenable spaces. And one very important aspect for the tall buildings, um, we build 14 stories of parking sometimes in the downtown of Miami in the high density areas, was insisting that those parking garages become lined with habitable space, um, which turns out to be very saleable and rentable, um, such as you see here. Uh, and finally, the transitions from the corridors to the neighborhoods behind them, um, how to step the buildings down, um, cover up the parking garages with habitable buildings and so on. Um, so there's just a few minutes left, and I'm going to show you um, two things that we're working on now, and then um, show you a few slides from the university uh, where I spend a lot of my time also. Um, this is just to illustrate that my, one of my current projects is the zoning code for the city of Coral Gables, um, an inner ring suburb, which um, has decided that although a lot of its zoning code works well, there are pieces of it that are um, confusing, hard to use, and contradictory. Does that sound familiar to any of the older people in the room? Um, and the reason is that codes have um, evolved from their 1920s beginnings without a good structure. Um, the American legal system keeps adding, uh, you know, what we do is that if you want a, a new law, you just put it on top of the old ones. We never clean out or restructure the old ones. And zoning codes have been doing that too. And so if any of you become interested in this kind of work, um, I would say it's an acquired taste that probably happens when you're much older. Um, you might find that there's going to be a lot of work in this arena. And as well, um, my partner Matt Lambert in Portland is working on the kind of bigger picture of regional planning. Um, and I think um, Peter Calthorpe um, started the, the idea of scenario planning, that you look at a region in terms of different types of towns. Um, or different types of development, whether it's a corridor or a neighborhood or a village. And, and then um, this is something that Matt put together with another firm called Placemakers um, uh, that gives instructions for each one of those. And I think this might have been, this was done for Dona Ana, which is in New Mexico, but they've just finished one for Michigan um, as well. So there's a kind of um, regional picture that's emerging um, of trying to give people a structure. It's a kind of quasi-scientific structure about what you do in difficult conditions. It's not just, it's not, um, it's not art. It's not um, uh, kind of innovation. It's what are the rational things that you do to make human settlements um, environmentally uh, responsible, economically sustainable, uh, and socially integrated. Those are the goals. You never get there, but you always keep trying. Um, and um, you've probably heard of tactical urbanism, the kind of first steps you can take um, to try to um, get people to think about their existing environment differently. Lean urbanism, which says, oh, yeah, we've been writing all these codes, but maybe there's too many regulations that are preventing people from doing things. Um, Detroit is following the lean urbanism um, path, and um, that's the charter of the new urbanism described in 27 chapters. So this is where some of that work takes place. This is our office in um, Miami. Um, that's how we looked many years ago in the upper left. Um, we've taken on some of our associates as partners and renamed the firm DPZ Co-Design. Um, this is how it looked um, maybe a year ago. We're dog friendly, as many offices are now. Um, and so uh, a few more things. Um, disaster recovery. Um, you know, I think you have tornadoes here, right? That's the worst thing that can happen. Um, well, we have hurricanes and um, it seems as if they're getting to be more severe or maybe people are in places where they shouldn't be. 
And so already we've done a number of um, endeavors with, in, with post-hurricane recovery. Um, in South Dade, uh, one of the results of the work was um, this neighborhood. It's a perfect little TND uh, that was built by Habitat. A lot of money comes into places um, that have been hurt, and then and the locals are all saying, what do we do with it? How do we use it? Well, and um, one of our commissioners said, um, let's, you know, this cash that's coming in, it's going to go to Habitat, and they're going to make a great place, and it's a, lo it's a longer, it's a good story. It's a longer story. Um, after the Katrina in New Orleans and Mississippi, 11 towns in Mississippi were virtually destroyed, and 100 CMUers got together in the one hotel that was left standing about three months after the hurricane um, to plan for those towns. Um, uh, that was, I'm sorry, that book. This was a pattern book which UDA, Urban Design Associates in Pittsburgh, their people produced, um, which was how to rebuild uh, using the traditions um, with uh, contemporary materials. Uh, Marianne Crusato and Andre Zlani developed um, an alternative for the FEMA trailer. Um, uh, there are a lot of stories about the trailers being trashed because they developed mold and um, all sorts of wasteful conditions. Um, and a number of these were built. Lowe's uh, was selling them as well. Um, they even became um, housing in first home communities. Um, in various parts of the country. Uh, and um, uh, Marianne ended up, she's a designer, she was an architect, she ended up going back to business school to figure out how to crack the mobile home market, um, the manufactured home market, um, which she's working on now. Um, after the earthquake in Haiti, um, the university did um, a charrette working with Haitian administrators to um, bring a plan to the United Nations um, as they were seeking funding um, to help them come out of the hurricane. Um, this is a big report. Uh, it's available through the UN, through the University of Miami, or I can always get it to you. Uh, and just a few pages from it um, um, focused on the medical facility that um, partners in health um, were building in one of the small towns outside of um, Port-au-Prince, Paul Farmer's endeavor. Um, on the one hand, another look at how the, some of the informal neighborhoods could be um, strengthened and allowed to redevelop in place without clearing um, the slums, uh, but actually in, engaging people in rebuilding them in place uh, to a higher standard. Um, we travel with our students. We try to get a group up to Seaside and the Panhandle um, once a year. Um, we emphasize drawing a lot, um, the hometown maps that help students get to know each other, but also uh, invite them to get to know where they're from through drawing, um, various kinds of experimental drawing, uh, studying history, um, there's a group of people who are working on um, health and design, um, not only hospital design, but how a hospital fits into a community. Um, that would be Joanna Lombard. Historic preservation um, is, of course, very important. Um, right now, there's a group that's recording the synagogues of the Caribbean under George Hernandez's uh, leadership. There's design build. Um, with Rocco Cheo and Jim Adamson, who's one of the Jersey, one of the Jersey Devils who um, retired to South Florida. Um, they built us this coffee kiosk for the school um, and uh, various types of travel programs there. You might see some of the diversity of the student body um, because people come to Miami from all over the world. And um, the Master of Urban Design uh, is the program that I'm currently directing. Um, so this is one that um, looks at contemporary projects as well as history. Um, uh, the concerns of our time, climate change, 
Um, these are, this is a drawing that Dennis Hector's studio did looking at what would happen to um, South Dade as the sea rises. It will look more and more like the Florida Keys because of the topography. Um, it lead, led me to start thinking about how, what tools that the new urbanism has developed might be available for climate change. And um, we drew this transect across South Florida from the Everglades to the beach, um, which shows essentially eight different, um, geographically different conditions related to the geology and the water table, um, which um, that's a whole other lecture. I can take you through each one of them. But this could apply to um, the fires in California, um, which apparently have geographic um, characteristics that related to where the winds are as well as where certain um, kinds of slopes and, and natural growth exists. And so um, I'm, there's a group of people in the Congress who are talking about what do we know or what tools have we developed that could be further advanced um, to work on these adaptation issues. Of course, the main one probably is how do you get people out of harm's way? We're living in altogether too many places uh, that we shouldn't be. Um, and um, of course, flood insurance, some government policies have promoted that. So um, there's a lot of work to be done for the next generation. And uh, finally, um, this is my studio, currently my introduction to urban design. Um, that's a 130 acre site in upper New York State that's um, very topographically difficult. So this group of students is gonna walk away understanding how to deal with topography. And they're all going, oh, we've never done this before. Um, which makes their teacher feel good. So thank you very much. So let me take the first question first, because that's, um, I think, a shorter answer. Um, what's the, is there an ideal block size? So it's not in the charter. It might be in the charter book. But there's a generally recognized convention that if you make the perimeter um, of the blocks average one quarter mile, 1,320 feet, some may be larger, some may be smaller, um, that you will make a walkable place. And if the block gets larger and you can put a pedestrian connection through, um, that can serve to overcome the, the lengths. Um, in fact, many cities uh, which have emerged on the Jeffersonian mile grid, like Miami, um, have a block length that turns out to be around 350 by 650 or it's not exactly that. But when you go from a, um, you know, the 10 acre plot down to the street grid, um, gridding that out, you end up with that. And what you'll find is that some of those places have naturally started to put pedestrian walks through. So I didn't show you the design district, but um, we've done that in a few 
pre-existing places where the blocks were too long. Oh, that's what we were doing in the Cleveland project as well. And the lead ND, I think, speaks to number of intersections per square mile so that you can, on a larger scale, um, get to the same point. And I think both of those kinds of conventional conventions, measurement conventions, will get you to a good place. And the second question. Um, you know, well, I think that you would see that complete urbanism in places that have rebuilt themselves, who started out with a good street grid and um, a good structure. So that structure is the most, the most difficult and the most powerful thing you can do. Um, so the problem, of course, the new places are in suburban places where it's one piece of land that one person owns and therefore it's easier to manage the implementation of the idea. Um, but a lot of that exterior has been set. So I understand this is a mixed group and maybe it's worth um, just giving you that hierarchy that the most powerful person in the room um, is the finance person, the person who has the money. So um, they're usually not in our rooms. They're just deciding. And by the way, now finance is driving the market, right? Wall Street decides that it wants to put its money somewhere and it's driving real estate development. And we need to get in there. The CNU needs to get in there and really start changing the way that's happening. The developer uses that money um, and can make the decisions about what's going to happen to the physical environment, the built environment. The rules are important, but you know there are ways of getting around them. Um, maybe the traffic engineers are up there too because they lay out those that overly large highway structure. Um, after that, the most powerful thing that any of us in the room can do is lay out the, the public and private realm, is lay out the street grid or the connectivity of the streets. Uh, because once it's in place, it's really hard to, to change. Um, and the Via Appia still exists in Italy 2,000 years later. Um, and so that's a very powerful thing to do. And if you can if you can't work in an existing area, if you have the chance at all to alter that at some regional, in some regional scale, it may at this point be only through policy. Um, you know, like the scenario planning document in which you encourage people to do that because you may never have that control over that much property to really make complete urbanism. But this, you know, all those organizations are working on it. You can be part of one of them to try to make it happen. Which discipline are you in? Um, I'm actually a city planner in a, in a small town outside of Indianapolis, but the, the wave of suburbia is, is making its way outward. And so uh, what we're trying to do is to uh, get away from multi-lane arterial because the town very much wants to stay small. So you probably need um, one of our traffic engineers who can talk to your county and state engineers. Um, and I'd be happy to give you some names if you don't know them. Hello. Yeah. Do you see community land trusts as being a viable opportunity for affordable housing? Um, oh, that's a very good question because the answer is yes. Um, there are... Um, so I mentioned that in regard to the farmland in metropolitan areas, when the real estate value exceeds the value of what you're trying to maintain or produce, um, and the three things essentially, or maybe there are four things um, that we are losing with high value real estate, um, really can only be 
saved or maintained through purchasing them. And so the land trust can hold land for affordable housing or buy the housing that's, that it already exists. Um, the first, the most important first step for affordable housing when things are getting unaffordable <coughs> is to um, buy as much of the still affordable stuff as you can. That's usually ahead of people knowing that they're gonna have a problem. Um, so yes, the community land trust is an important tool and similarly it can be used, something like that should be used for historic preservation, although TDRs work well for historic preservation, um, for maintaining agricultural land um, and also open space, maintaining open space. Thank you. So um, I didn't show you Rosemary Beach, but there was there's a real evolution, and um, more than anything else, that had to do with the private development need for identification and differentiation. Um, although the hardened um, Alice Beach fulfilled many um, of not only our, but many people's desire to bring the courtyard house to the American culture um, as the ultimately secure um, residence. You know, that your garden is inside mm -hmm. and you have only, and you have a small public face only. Um, and there are beautiful prototypes, so you know, there was a desire to make a beautiful place. Now, part of Alice Beach is really over the top in terms of the architecture, um, the, the, especially the expense of the architecture, but um, there are some beautiful courtyard houses in it. And, and so, you know, this is um, that bedeviling trickle-down theory that um, sometimes the conservatives use, which um, is, not, is usually not a good argument. Um, but these places have had a lot of influence because they have been beautifully built and many different families or homeowners put a lot of money to build their house to be part of this community. You know, there's a certain kind of competition. Um, and then the people from Cleveland come and say, well, why can't we do this? You know, we'll do it more modestly, but, uh, and so when, when those influences occur, then the fact that you're, you have people building kind of very elaborate things um, takes on a different meaning. Um, and so I think there, in some ways, those were experimental um, in terms of design, uh, but they have their, they have their own um, offspring. People learn from them. Thank you.